only year two of the Mark Richt era in Miami, but already Hurricanes football is on the rise and looking to recapture the glory days of top rankings and national championships. We'll discuss the possibility of another national title run this season, the overall state of the program, the talent on this year's team to keep an eye on, and much more as we go one-on-one -on -one with Gary Furman, editor for Canesport.com for Miami Hurricanes football on the OFN Meeting Room with Greg DePom. It's November the 8th, 2017. I'm Greg DePama. Thanks for tuning into the OFN Meeting Room as we talk Miami Hurricanes football with Gary Furman. So, Gary, thanks for joining us today. Oh, anytime, Greg. Happy to be here. Well, Gary, uh, and, and we should let the listeners know, we, we have a long history that goes back uh, many years. I think it's been, I don't know how long it's been since we've actually spoken, but uh, it, uh, I think we worked together, what, 15 years ago? Is that, is that, am I overdating it? or? Uh, uh I'm, I'm, I'm sure that, it, that that that's included in it. You're going to make us sound old here. I know. I know it's tough, but it is what it is. What can we do? But we're still hanging in there. And, of course, you're still with uh, Kane Sport. And, of course, you were with Kane Sport uh, back when I knew you when we were doing some shows uh, uh, on a Fox uh, radio station down in Fort Lauderdale. And uh, so, I mean, it's a long time to be doing what you're doing. Uh, you must really love uh, the work you're doing with uh, with the Hurricanes at Kane Sport. Yeah, I think I've been covering Miami football now for, for I think, 37 years wow that's <laughs> so, awesome so yeah i've seen it's seen a lot oh during that time a lot of great teams some that were among the best in college football history and then you know, miami's had some tough times over the last uh 10 12 years where it's really been struggling to get it back together get the right coaching staff in place and get back uh, to the college football stage and um it's there now and, and saturday night is, is a perfect example of that second week in a row that ABC has made a trip to Miami. It's, it's a prime time showcase on ABC. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, Miami, Notre Dame back in action. One of the more storied rivalries in college football history. Uh -huh. uh, it got so heated in 1990, Greg, that they canceled it. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but now they're back to playing each other again every now and then. And uh, they played last year at South Bend. They're playing this year in Miami. And then as part of the ACC rotation that Notre Dame has now, uh, they'll be playing together again in a few, you know, a few more years down the road. So it's great to see Miami and Notre Dame back on the field again. It's great that the game has such implications that both teams have kind of remade their program the last couple of years yep. and gotten back into the, very quickly, I might add, gotten back into the, the national um, focus of college football. And, uh, Saturday night's game should be a good one. Yeah, and a matter of fact, last week I was talking with uh, Mike Frank from irissportsdaily.com about what's going on with Notre Dame, and uh, we kind of looked ahead and talked about th that this game, if Miami had beaten Virginia Tech and Notre Dame had beaten Wake Forest, was going to be that that much more significant, and that um, – you know, because I don't really think a whole lot of people were, were, were paying too much attention to that. That we just, I, And I don't think it, it really happens until maybe Monday where people start to realize, yeah. wait a second, Miami, Notre Dame, both in the top 10, this rivalry. I mean, and, and, and that's awesome. It's awesome for the sport. It's, it's, uh, it's perfect timing, too, since both teams, as you mentioned, are, are, are both playing as well as they're playing. Yeah, it's kind of like it has kind of snuck up on everybody. And, you know, Notre Dame lost the game to Georgia early in the season. They were unranked coming into the year. Yep. And they were unranked again after losing to Georgia. And then, you know, now they've, they've peeled off this run of victories and looked very impressive doing so. And that's allowed them to rise up in the polls. And, the, you know, I think when you're Notre Dame, you rise up quicker than most. Yeah. <laughs> um, which, which is how they've gotten all the way to number three at this yes. point. But, yep. um, you know, the, the rankings are insignificant. I mean, it, the, the beauty of this thing is that it's going to get decided on the field on Saturday night. And um, the Notre Dame story is impressive. There's no question about it. Uh, they were a program that was absolutely reeling at the end of last year. They went four and eight and uh, were at a crossroads. They decided to let Brian Kelly try to fix it as opposed to firing him. And he replaced six coaches and a strength coach, uh, just totally cleaned out the program, brought in all new faces, and obviously it's worked for them. And, uh, you know, they're, they're sitting here right in the middle of things late in the season, and they're going to be an incredible test for Miami on Saturday night. They have a really good offensive line. They, they've kind of remade themselves as a power football team, which was probably a good move by yes. them. They were, they were really trying to be like a, like a Florida football team 
uh, the first few years of Brian Kelly, and it wasn't working for them because those aren't the kind of athletes that they recruit to Notre Dame. Um, they were, you know, they can recruit good linemen, they can recruit good running backs, they yep. can recruit good defensive linemen, and, and they've kind of remade themselves into a power team. And, and uh, it's a little bit different than what Miami plays week in and week out in Florida State and, and all these teams throughout the ACC, which are more finesse type teams. So um, from Miami standpoint, it's a question of how, how are they going to hold up to that brand of football? Now, in the glory days of Miami, when they played teams like this, it usually went pretty well. Miami's speed and athleticism um, were able to prevail over the power and strength of teams like Notre Dame. So it's going to be interesting to see, you know, where at this stage in its development Miami um, fares on Saturday night in, in trying to do the same thing. Well, uh, speaking of that defense, because, uh, again, one of the things that <clears throat> we know that with Mark Ricks, which I absolutely just loved, and I'm sure uh, I would imagine Hurricanes fans did as well, just love the hiring. Uh, for Rick to go back uh, to his alma mater, uh, and uh, that's George's loss, but it, it's per- actually worked out really good for both teams because Kirby Smart knows what he's doing. So sometimes you just need a, a new voice, and now Mark Rick goes to Miami. And uh, but these aren't necessarily his players, of course. So just imagine, I got to I got to believe that the excitement of once Rick is able to recruit his own players uh, that two or three years from now, this program is definitely going to be back to where they were. Uh, back in uh, the late 90s and early 2000s. And, and what we're seeing right well, now is just going to happen every year. They're not his players, but he, you know, he did inherit a reasonable amount of talent from Golden. Uh, you know, Miami is still Miami, and it still can recruit South Florida players, and there's still a lot of them, and a lot of them are very good. And, uh, you know, the new direction that they've been taking in has made a lot of these guys better. And one of the reasons why Miami is having such a good season this year is because of the what they're getting out of guys that were buried on the roster that you didn't think was ever going to play. I mean, okay. uh, cornerback Michael Jackson, a, a, a kid that uh, you never would, would you would have thought never would play at Miami, who's now I mean ABC was calling him one of the top corners in the country after watching him last week. Um, you know, a receiver Daryl Langham who. who Looked like he would never play a Miami, who suddenly makes the big plays against Florida State and Georgia Tech to help Miami win those tight, tight games that last year they were losing. Um, and you could go on and on. I mean, there's guys that have emerged all over this roster that aren't necessarily Mark Rick recruits, but that's, that this Mark Rick coaching staff yep. have been able to develop and get something out of and get contributions. And when you watch Miami on defense, the one thing you'll notice is the way they're rotating guys in and out constantly. And, um, you know, they're bringing in second and sometimes third teamers, and they're not experiencing a, a real drop-off from their first teamers. And uh, that's coaching. And, and I was watching Brian Kelly's press conference this week, and one of the things he said over and over again that, that jumped out to their staff in watching Miami's tape is how well-coached Miami is. And he said it many times, like, you can have all the athletes in the world, but if you don't coach them well, it doesn't matter. And um, the thing that people are noticing is how well-coached this Miami team is, and, and uh, it's paying dividends because they're undefeated. They've got the longest win streak in the country. They've now won 13 straight games, Greg, which is unbelievable when you look at where they're coming from. So really on both sides of the ball in this game, you've just got great reclamation stories. Well, talk about uh, the – I know yesterday Dan Shanka uh, talked about a couple of uh, players that are rated pretty high – well, two of the top rated players that he has ranked right now for the NFL draft uh, come out of Miami, one on defense and that's Chad Thomas. Uh, Chad was uh, a a big time recruit Uh, statistically hasn't yet developed into the player that maybe everybody thought he was going to develop into. Uh, But tell me how things have gone on with him since Rick has taken over since Manny Diaz has taken over. Uh, And is he right now, you can can say what you want about the NFL draft because he's a senior, he's going to go into the draft. Uh, But is he the most talented player on this defense or are there other players that might be a little bit younger that we should be keeping an eye on besides some of the ones you've already mentioned, including Michael Jackson? Yeah, I would not say that he's the most talented player on the defense. He's having a decent senior year. um, And I imagine he will get drafted as much on potential as anything else. Uh, I don't know how high that that will end up being. I mean, I'm guessing, you know, third, fourth round, somewhere in there. Um, But I think um, in terms of the draft, you got to look at Miami's two defensive tackles who are juniors, um, Kendrick Norton and R.J. McIntosh. McIntosh in particular is having a really good year. 
Um, I think if, you know, the, the big question for Miami is are they going to declare for the draft or are they going to come back for their senior years? Uh, I think that I personally think they should come back for their senior years. I think that they still have upside. And I think if, if, if they do come back, that McIntosh in particular can emerge as a potential first round pick next year. Mm. Um, and I, and I think Norton, you know, could potentially emerge as like a second or third rounder. Okay. Um, that's, you know, my, that's my own projections. If, if they come back as seniors. Now, if they go out as juniors, I'm not really sure, you know, how the league will, will, will rank them. Uh, you know, I imagine they're still under evaluation, uh, but but they're both you know decent defensive tackles uh, who I think still have upside. Um, so you got to look at them. Um, I, I think that Miami is not a team that's loaded with really first round picks, but as usual, we'll have a lot of guys that you know are draft worthy and and will get picked in the draft. I, I think that you know just going. Going down um, the list, I think, you know, uh, Chris Herndon, the tight end, yeah. is certainly a guy that's going to get drafted. He's having a great season. Uh, hard for tight ends to get drafted high. There's only so many David Njoku's, and he doesn't have Njoku-like speed. Uh, but he's a he's a quality tight end who I think can play in the league. I think you'll see him get drafted probably in the fourth round. Um, maybe slight chance he can elevate into the third, but he's having a really good year. I think the left tackle, Casey McDermott, is a kid that probably has played his way into the draft as a mid-round to late-round draft pick. Doesn't have the greatest athletic ability in the world, but he can play multiple positions. He's played guard. He's played tackle. Um, I think that he could be projected as a decent, um, maybe backup offensive lineman in the National Football League. We, we talked about um, Thomas and, and McIntosh and, and Norton. Um I think that um what about D Delaney? Delaney yeah, though, what about Delaney? Yeah, you know, yeah, D, D Delaney's a, a guy that, that that has a chance to get drafted in the middle round. Okay. Uh he got hurt. Mm -hmm. He's kind of like, you know, fallen a little bit down the depth chart because of that because the other guys have been playing so well. Uh but he's a big corner and the NFL obviously has a great need and loves big corners. So, you know, I think that you know, you could see him get drafted. Uh, the kicker, Michael Badgley, I think will be one of the top kickers in the country. Uh, very few kickers get drafted. I don't know if somebody will spend a seventh rounder or something on him, but, you know, he's a guy that I think has the capability to play in the National Football League. And a, and a, a guy that I failed to mention who might have worked his way into a late round draft pick is Brad Marios, the receiver who's having a really good senior season. He's a, he can return punts. Um, the issue with Braxton is just his size, and I don't know. Yeah how the pro scouts will feel about that, but he's having a great senior season. Yeah, is Barrios the, the go-to guy? Is he the guy that they really need to pick up a first down on fourth down? That uh, That's where Rozier's going to go? Um, yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, he's been the go-to guy, and he, he's just been so steady and, and reliable so far this year, and um, he's going to be a big part of every game down the stretch. Now, I'm on R Richards. Is he the most talented uh, out of all the receivers? No and, 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 and no doubt, Amon, Amon, you know he's been he's been hurt most of the year, Greg, and uh, he injured his hamstring in, in training camp, and has been fighting it the whole season. Didn't really play in, until the third week of the season, and he's been tweet, you know, he's been tweaking the injury pretty much every week, and he's going out there and does, and he brings so much to the table. I mean, uh, you know, hopefully for him. He's getting more healthy now and, and, and can be a big part of the game this weekend. But he's elite. And uh, he's a kid that he, he blocks well downfield and uh, does so many different things that help you win games. And, uh, you know, I think he's a future first round draft pick, you know, not, not this year, but next year. And, um, you know, he's just a great, great player and a great kid. And, uh, of course, the, the major injury for the team was Mark Walton, but uh, Travis H uh, Homer has done an incredible job. Uh, I don't even think that uh, fans uh, are, are down there are probably surprised either. Uh, Homer uh, looking pretty good as the number two guy behind Walton. Uh, let me ask you, do you think Homer's actually better than Walton? I think they're different. Um, I think both are effective, and, um, you know, I don't really see, think that there's a need to necessarily compare them. Okay. Um, the big question for Miami running back going forward is, is Walton going to declare for the draft this year and go out? Uh, I don't know if that's a wise thing. I think he really wants to do that. 
Uh, I don't think he, I think he'd probably be about a fourth round draft pick if he does. Uh, so I don't know, you know, what he's going to do, but, um, Homer has certainly not given Miami a drop off. I mean, he's been no. getting the job done, making a lot of plays and, uh, they've been using him very wisely. He's a smaller running back. Uh, they haven't been beating him to a pulp. Um, you know, he's been coming in somewhere between 15 and 20 carries a game and getting a few targets in the passing game. And he, he, he hasn't disappointed at all. He's, he's done nothing but deliver. All right, so uh, let's talk about this uh, matchup then a little bit more. Uh, and because uh, y- you, you you take a look at this uh, front seven for Miami, and as you mentioned, they're going to be rotating a lot of players in uh, Notre Dame. Uh, they've got that big time offensive line. Uh, we uh, Dan Shanka also talked uh, yesterday about both McGlinchey and Quentin Nelson. Who, by the way, he's got Quentin Nelson right now as his top rated offensive lineman in the draft, and that's uh, u- that's unusual for a guard. That just shows you how talented this Nelson kid is. And he got Josh Allen, Adams, and Wimbush. So. That's the strength of their team. They want to run the ball. Wimbush has done a decent job when he's had to throw the ball. He's not a for, you know, he's not, that's, that's not, his, that's not the approach right now, uh, but they want to run the football. So uh, what is your best guess on whether or not you think Miami is going to be able to contain that rushing attack, not get worn down in the fourth quarter and at least limit the production enough. So the offense can also do their job because to tell you the truth, I'm not even sure what happened with Notre Dame's defense last week, unless they were looking ahead to Miami because uh, it was kind of unusual because their defense had played pretty well up until that point last week against Wake Forest. Forest, even though it's, a, as you know, much better Wake Forest team this year, uh, but a one-dimensional Wake Forest team. So I, I'm going to chalk that up to my Notre Dame was looking ahead to Miami. Uh, and uh, But this is, to me, appears like, of course, uh, a game that, like we've seen time and time again this season, that should go down to the wire uh, if you're a Miami Hurricane fan. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think that's the big question of this game for Miami. Uh, you know, how are they going to hold up? against that physical mindset of Notre Dame. Uh, th- th- this is a team that's played nothing but finesse football. I mean, let's be honest. And, and, and plays finesse football very well. How are they going to respond with, when you have these big dudes, you know, who are tough guys from the Midwest sitting there pounding at you every single play and not letting you do whatever you want. And, uh, the key to the game is going to be what can Manny Diaz do schematically to free his guys and, and not allow them to be susceptible to, to, to that power offensive game. And if he's successful in figuring it out, Miami more than likely will win the game. And if Notre Dame's able to control the football and pound Miami down the field, then Notre Dame's going to probably win the game. And how about on the flip side uh, for Miami's offense? Because uh, Rozier's been a little bit inconsistent the last few weeks. So w- what's going on there? Why do you think he hasn't necessarily been playing his best, especially when you take a look at the North Carolina game? Because when you have a lot of close games, uh, and, and it's not like they had a lot of close games to begin the season, but th- they've had this run, of course, over the last five games, or the last four games going to last week, where just about every game was close, and everybody expected the North Carolina game was going to be the breather game. And even that game went down to the wire. So how important, even though they won going away last week, Rozier did not have a great game. So any particular thing that the opponents are seeing uh, with Rozier that they're now limiting him in some capacity, they're, 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 they're seeing something in the Miami's game, or do you just think Rozier has just had a you know, winning consistent couple of weeks and uh, you feel confident he'll be okay on Saturday night? I mean, I, I, I think you gotta, you got to be honest about what Malik Rozier is and He's a career. He was a career backup quarterback to this point, who basically was getting his chance at Miami because there was nobody else. I mean, you know, a year ago, Mark Rick was telling them that he would never play for him. Um, and why did he say there, that? Well, because he just wasn't very good. And okay. He wasn't getting a lot done in practice. I think he fell into the rut of being a backup quarterback, and maybe wasn't working as hard as he needed to work, and wasn't as focused as he needed to be. Okay. And it all contributed to him not being real good. And uh, to Malik Rozier's credit, he didn't take that to heart. He decided to make himself better, and, and, it, and he won the job in, in the spring and fall by being pretty good. But that doesn't mean that you're talking about you know a guy that's ready for the national football. Sure, sure. I mean, you know, and and you know, I think that Malik Rozier has played as well as Miami could possibly expect him to play i i think that he is he has been inconsistent which shouldn't be a surprise 
Um, but he also has been really good at times, and he's been really good with when the game's been on the line, and, yes. and he's made the throws he needed to make to yep. out victories. And yeah, they, they were a little closer than maybe they could have been or should have been based on how Miami stacked up overall to the teams they were playing. Um, but they won. And, you know, I think you got to give him credit for making the plays that he needed to make to win the games. And um, I think that that's what you're going to get Saturday night. I mean, he's not going to be a great quarterback on every single play. But what Miami has to hope for is that when the key plays come up in the game plan and they have to have it um, and they have to be able to get winning plays from their quarterback, that he's able to deliver. And so far this year, he has been. And that's what's going to have to take place if Miami's going to win these key games down the stretch. All right. Well, uh, since, of course, you're you're with rivals, there's, there's a lot of knowledge there with recruiting uh, for the program. So tell me, what's, uh, what, what's on the horizon? Do they have their quarterback of the future, uh, either on the team now or, uh, or, or somewhere, somewhere uh, in the next uh, couple of recruiting cycles? Well, you know, they're going to take a quarterback every single year. I mean, there's, you know, like everybody, every other major program in the country. So, you know, do they have their quarterback of the future? Uh, will be dependent on who ends up winning the job when the job is open. They've got a young kid by the name of Nikozi Perry, who's a very good prospect. Uh, he's just, very, you know, very, very young right now okay. and, and not really physically developed. Uh, they need to take a, a, a good off season in the strength and conditioning program to start building him up. And if everything goes perfectly and Rozier is the quarterback again next year, uh, then you'll have Re- Nicozy Perry sitting there um, as a redshirt sophomore uh, ready to compete and physically ready to take over the job for okay. two or three years. Now, um, whether that'll be play out that way will be dependent on who Miami recruits this year and and how they're able, and I guess next year, and how they're able to compete with Nicozy Perry. And, um there look there's a kid named Jaron Williams who from Georgia who they're recruiting who is coming for an official visit this weekend. We'll see how that one goes. Obviously there'll be quarterbacks in twenty nineteen that they're looking at. So um I think it's premature to say who the quarterback of the future will be, but I think Mark Rick is is accumulating chips in that regard, and then it'll be a competition to see who's the best. Yeah, and and if we know uh, Mark Rick like we know him, uh, being a former quarterback and all the quarterbacks that he was able to recruit at Georgia, uh, I, I mean, I mean, just look at the look at the, what what they have there right now. I mean, they have two quarterbacks. I mean, Eason should be starting, uh, but they've got Fromm, so Eason will probably transfer. Maybe he'll transfer yep. to Miami. No, uh, but anyway, but you know that yeah, Rick is going to find quarterbacks. Happen, but yeah, but. but but yeah, I mean, he, Mark Rick throughout his career has been very good at, at in, in most stages of stacking the quarterbacks on top of each other. There have been times where, they, where he was left without a really good quarterback, and I think that ultimately led to his, um, yeah. I guess, uh, slide in favor, I guess would be the best terminology to use at Georgia, because, yeah. I mean, it certainly wasn't a byproduct of the program falling apart. I mean, you see what he left them. I mean, they're in the top, they're, in the, they're ranked number one in the in the college football rankings, yeah. Rankings, rankings. So, yeah, and and that's with talent that Mark Rick left them for the most part. So, um, you know, he's done a good job of, of stacking up his quarterbacks through the years, and that's what he's uh, trying to accomplish now at Miami. All right. Uh, so, a couple more things before I let you go. Uh, w- w- when uh, when Butch Davis got the job uh, with FIU, how did how did that go around down there in South Florida? Was that a big surprise? Was that something that everybody thought yeah. was going to happen for Butch. He was going to get back into the game uh, because it seemed like a, a, a nice fit and, and the, the team is starting to play better. Yeah, it's a good fit. And, 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 you know, people obviously noticed it, but it's, you know, nobody's really wired into FIU football. In South Florida. <laughs> I mean, nobody, you know, nobody, they, they, they draw very few people. Uh-huh. Nobody really talks about it. It's, you know, really, it, it was a landing spot for Butch, and it was great for him because it got him back into coaching. Uh, I don't know if it will lead to something else. He's, you know, he's getting kind of older, but um, it's been great for him. He's doing a very good job there. But I don't know that FIU football is going to be able to make its way into the major sports landscape in South Florida. Yeah, yeah, I, we know how difficult it is, even for the the top teams. Um, okay, so uh, give me your uh, your your not necessarily prediction, but what do you what do you think is going to happen on Saturday night? What's your gut tell you uh, you're going to see from Miami? 
I think the Miami offense will be able to have some success against Notre Dame at times. I, I you know, I, I think that they're going to be able to score. I think the, the big question is going to be whether they can stop Notre Dame's offense. And, and, you know, obviously they've got a lot of very good players on, on defense. They've been having a very su- successful season, but like we said earlier, it, 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 this is a different style of football. This is ground and pound. This is power football. And we're going to have to see how tough they are. Uh, you know, they haven't been tested really other than in the Georgia Tech game from a toughness standpoint. And I think what Notre Dame is bringing to the table Saturday night is significantly better than Georgia Tech. So um, they have not been tested in this way this year. And I think it's going to be very interesting to see how they hold up to it. And it's very hard to predict what's going to happen. Yeah, it's a tough one. We don't have any to, to base a prediction on. Yeah, it's a, it's it can go either way. It's a flip of the coin game. There ain't no question about that. Uh, by the way, yeah, this is not an ACC The betters game. out there would be crazy to mess with this game. I agree. I, mean, I, I agree. The, I mean, a- anything can happen in this game. And, and I don't think that there's any – Anything that you can hang your hat on no. as a as a as a better at all. No. Uh that's uh this is the game that I think, especially with the history, that you should just enjoy as a fan and uh, and hope it's as as good as a game as we're all uh, hoping it will be. Uh by the way, since this is not an ACC game and Miami beat Virginia Tech last week, they're pretty much set, right? I mean, the chances of them losing to Virginia and Pittsburgh are pretty slim. Not to say that it couldn't happen, but it's looking pretty solid that they're gonna be in the ACC championship game. Yeah, I, I mean, I think they, they they would have to work real hard to mess that up. Um, no argument for me on that. Um, I think they're significantly better than Virginia and Pittsburgh, and I think that they've got their eye on the prize. And uh, you know, I think Miami will be in, in Charlotte to play Clemson. To play Clemson, another yeah, game. yeah, and and we look forward to talking to you definitely before that one. Uh, great job as always, Gary. Uh, best of luck uh, in the game on Saturday, and uh, we're uh, we're looking forward to talking to you again. Uh, many more times here uh, at our lads. So uh, enjoy the game, and thanks for uh, taking the time out to talk to us. All right, Greg, anytime. All right, thank you, Gary. That's Gary Furman, editor of Kane Sport at Rivals. That's Kane Sport at Rivals.com. So, uh, again, Gary and I go uh, way back, way back, way back. Uh, as way back as I can go almost. As way back as I can. I mean, th- those were that, – that I shouldn't say that because I was prop- – well, yeah, maybe I should. That was pretty much the, the the end of my radio days in the South Florida market, uh, because I did spend uh, years after that building up my internet uh, career, uh, and then of course uh, transferred over uh, from uh, my internet career uh, over to. Hold on a second, Gary, you there? I'm still on the air. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Tell you to send me an MP3. Oh, you got it, Gary. Don't worry about that. Uh, you, uh, that's coming. Yes. No problem. Yes, email, email me an MP3 of that. You got it, Gary. Take care. Uh, All right. See, I'm not going to tell Gary that. Well, he's going to know. He's going to just hear it. So he's going to go, oh, my goodness. Did I just say shit on the air? But you did, Gary. But that's okay. See, you probably thought I was on. he was on hold. Things aren't very sophisticated here, Gary. So I thought Gary was calling me back because he wanted to do something else he wanted to say. Usually I would not have, have, have answered that. I would have said, oh, okay, Gary's calling back. I wonder, but I was like, well, maybe he has something else he wants to say. I'm going to put him back on the air. That's why I, I, I said it, Gary. I said, you're on the air. We're, we're still on the air, Gary. But I guess he thought that things were a little bit more sophisticated here than they are. Sorry about that, Gary. But that's okay. Nobody cares. It's the internet, man. Relax. Uh, okay, so, uh, but yeah, Gary and I go way back uh, to the days of South Florida, and uh, it, uh, it, it, I was there. Uh, actually, not only, of course, we talked last week about it when I was doing the FAU interview, uh, and uh, by the way, of course, that went off pretty well. I like it when I do the interviews, like, uh, uh, and 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 then you know we have the our special guests on, especially from like the uh, the smaller programs. Uh, I haven't had an FIU interview yet, uh, but to be able to have uh, like last week, we, we, we had a FAU talk with Chuck King, managing editor of FAU owl And we were talking about how if, you know, actually, I think that was on Friday and then the game was on Friday night and then they went out and they beat Marshall. So I, that, that's a good thing. I like that. I like when we have those interviews and it works out and then they go out and they win games and that's pretty awesome. Matter of fact, same thing happened when we talked with Tommy Birch from the Des Moines Register uh, for Iowa State the, the week for the TCU game. So that went really well. So um, 
can't really say that's going to go well definitely this week because we had Mike Frank on last week for Notre Dame and also Gary Furman this week. Now, as I've said earlier in the week, I do lean towards Notre Dame. I completely agree with Gary that I do not believe that uh, this is a game, though, that for sports bettors out there that I would necessarily wager on. I mean, if you're somebody that just likes to wager just because it's like, hey, you know what? I like to wager. It's a big game. It's a Saturday night. Uh, and, and and I kind of think so-and-so is going to win, then go ahead and do it. Why not? Hey, that's what you want to do. Uh, nobody's going to stop you, uh, no, nor should we. Uh, but if you're like, hey, man, I need a game this week. Yeah, Gary's right. No way do you touch this game. Now, I'm leaning towards Notre Dame. I lean towards Notre Dame at the beginning of the week. I'm still leaning towards Notre Dame. Uh, I, I think part of that has to do with the fact that Miami hasn't really played a game like this before, not just from Gary's uh, point of view as far as uh, you know, the, the physicality of the opponent. Uh but it's more than that. It, it's the quality of the opponent. They just, you just haven't. Miami has not played a team as good and as hot as Notre Dame is right now. Uh, sure, Virginia Tech came in last week and they were feeling good about themselves and all of that. But Virginia Tech is not on the same par as Notre Dame. They're just not. Uh, matter of fact, I liked Miami last week, as you know. So, uh, but I, I just Notre Dame is just. Uh, that's why I don't care about what happened last week. And and and, and may, they look, maybe if Miami scores 35, 38 points this week, that that'll be different. And I'll go. Well, maybe that was a sign of uh, of Wake Forest finding something in Notre Dame's defense and exploiting it. I don't think that's the case. I, I look at it more of Notre Dame gets off to a lead. They're coasting. They're looking ahead. Uh, they were never really in trouble and all that kind of stuff. That's kind of how I looked at it. So I'm not really concerned about what happened last week with Notre Dame. Uh, and uh, I think it is a good sign, though, for Miami in, in, in score wise that they didn't all go down to the wire once again with Virginia Tech. So there's that. But as we also talked about, I, I'm a little bit worried about Rozier. Uh, he has the kind of games that he's had the last couple of weeks. There's not going to be Notre Dame. He's going to have to have his best game because he's playing his best team. So that's that's that. You have your best game. You're at home. And the game goes down to the wire. Uh, which it can, and you've been able to pull these games out before, then by all means, I think Rozier uh, could do it. And uh, Richt is not going to see, see Richt. This is another reason I like Miami last week against Virginia Tech. As great as a job Fuente's done the last couple of years, Rick's a better coach. But Rick is not going to have that advantage here this week. Now, I still think Rick is a better coach, but I don't think it's like one of those things where you take Miami over Notre Dame because of the coaching situation. That's that's not going to happen this week. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to lean towards Notre Dame in this one. And if Notre Dame does win this football game, uh, Notre Dame is going to have a, a pretty good chance. Now, they still have a couple of games left. Navy's never easy. And of course, at Stanford, no championship game for them to worry about. But they played enough tough teams. I'm not worried about Notre Dame having to play a championship game. I think they've earned it. Uh, so Notre Dame, if they can get past this game, I believe, and I said this uh, on the Monday show, I believe Notre Dame is going to end up in the playoffs. So this is the game, in my mind, that could very well seal the deal for them. But you never know, because there's going to be a lot of pressure, whether it's on Navy, against Navy or definitely at Stanford. The pressure will be there. You win. You're in the playoffs. You lose. You're not. How will the kids handle that? Uh, Stanford is not an easy team to play against. You've got Love, uh, could be a Heisman guy. Uh, he probably won't be, of course. He's probably not going to win it because Stanford is not as relevant as, say, Baker Mayfield and uh, a few of the other kids that are out there uh, is vying for a national championship and things of that nature. But Love is a very talented player. If he has a big game, what Notre Dame could be in big trouble. Notre Dame has struggled against Stanford in recent years. Those games have gone down to the wire, been very close. So there's still a lot of football to be played after this. But my gut just tells me if Notre Dame wins this game, uh, they're going to wind up as a playoff team. As far as Miami, I said this about a month ago, that this team was going to be back to this situation as a top 10 team. And this was going to be uh, the Miami team moving forward with Mark Rick. So get used to it. But that this year they did not have a team to win the national championship. And they may not even have a team next year to win a national championship. But watch out in the coming years because this program is relevant again. As soon as they brought Mark Rick back, this team was relevant. I mean, the program was relevant again. Uh, so it's not going to be this year. They're not. And, and I also, as I said the other day, Miami loses this game. They're done. They're not going to the playoffs. They cannot go to the playoffs with one loss. I don't care what other scenarios happen. I don't care if they beat Clemson in an ACC championship game. They are not going to the playoffs. They would need 
eight or ten different things to happen to get a shot at the playoffs with one loss. That's just it's just not going to happen. Uh, especially when the, you know, I, well, I'm not even going to go, especially they're just not okay. They have to win this football game. They have to go undefeated because I'll tell you this, they could even go undefeated and might have a chance. I might have a hard time getting in. Now I think they would. I think the only way they wouldn't would be if Wisconsin went undefeated. Uh, and then of course you had the other teams ahead of them. Uh, like, let's see at that point, you would still have Oklahoma ahead of them with one loss, but Oklahoma will, will have had some big wins, uh, that, uh, Miami would have a couple big wins as well, but I, it's tricky. I mean, I'm not saying Miami couldn't leapfrog Oklahoma if they beat, if they beat Notre Dame and Clemson, I'm just saying it's tricky. It's it. And then would they leapfrog Alabama and Georgia? Cause one of those teams, let's say they, they continue to win and they only beat each other and that's it. One team's undefeated. One team has a loss. Uh, no, I don't think Miami leapfrog either one of those teams either, uh, especially uh, one loss Alabama or one loss Georgia. Uh, but uh, it could happen. All right. Here's the thing. I don't think it's going to happen. I just can't see Miami running the table with this team. If they beat Notre Dame, then beating Clemson and also winning a couple of games where the pressure is going to be on them as well, because that's the thing you all you got to keep in mind. They go to that Pittsburgh game. I think it's on a Friday night on the road. Pittsburgh's starting to play better. All of the pressure on them, if they're still undefeated, and I'm telling you, I've seen it before, it will not be easy for them. So this is not about winning a national championship this year for Miami. This is about building a program for the long haul. This is about getting back to where you were uh, in the old days, the good days, even the Larry Cooker days, the Jimmy Johnsons, the, the Ericsons, and the Schnellenberger days. That's exactly what this is. And they're going to do it. There is no doubt in my mind that the Miami football program is just going to get better and better every year. Just like I, I, there's no doubt in my mind, the Michigan program with Harbaugh. Those are two great his, his, you know, historical programs that have not been relevant enough recently that are about to get relevant. And with Michigan, it's just a, it's just a matter of the recruiting cycles that keep coming in for Harbaugh and finding that young hotshot quarterback, whether it's Peters or McCaffrey, once those kids start developing in the next year or two, watch out for Michigan football. And the same thing with Miami, watch out for Miami. So those are two programs that if you want to buy stock in, if you want to buy stock in any programs in college football right now, that you would say two to three years from now, and then you know, from, from let's say uh, the 2019 season to 2025, you know, which teams, which two programs might have more top five appearances. Uh, and, and we'll say, let's, let's, let's keep Alabama in there, of course, because in Nick Saban, uh, if you had to pinpoint a couple of teams, I would pinpoint those two right there, Miami and Michigan. Okay. So uh, that is going to wrap it up on this program. Uh, by the way, uh, don't forget also to check back with us as we have more of these interviews this week. Uh, we are going to be interviewing uh, B.J. Rains later on tonight to talk Boise State football. Uh, we've got Jerry Radcliffe uh, tomorrow. I think it's tomorrow. I think it's tomorrow morning uh, to talk Virginia football, their first bowl appearance uh, in a few years. And also then on Friday, our college football show. Keep that in mind. Two o'clock Friday, every Friday, college football preview. We preview the weekend. Our special guest will be Jeremy Clark to talk TCU football from HornFrogBlitz.com. And also Hondo Carpenter uh, from Scout uh, covers Michigan State football. Talk about the Michigan State game and the Ohio State Buckeyes. So that's coming up later on this week on the OFN Meeting Room and also our OFN College Football Preview Show, which is on Friday. So for Gary Furman of Kane Sport uh, over at Rivals, I'm Greg DePama, and thank you for tuning in here to the OFN Meeting Room on the Our Lads Football Radio Network. And uh, Our Lads, is, of course, is where you want to go for the NFL Draft. So uh, we'll see you next time. Follow us on Twitter at PrimeSN, and thanks for tuning in.